Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1, Saturdays and Sundays, and uh, quite a few variety of time we have now these days with the new channels we have, So, but still the traditional Sunday at 8.30 and 4.30 still work at that time. You can also find um, Wichita Liberty TV on the internet, that's my site, The Voice for Liberty at Wichita Liberty. Org. We'll have show notes for this episode, plus all the other episodes of Wichita Liberty TV there. So today our guest is United, Represent United States Representative Ron Estes, who represents the 4th District of Kansas. That's Greater Wichita and a number of counties both to the east and the west. Ron had a career in the private sector, then became the treasurer of Sedgwick County, then the treasurer for the state of Kansas, and earlier this year when Mike Pompeo resigned to uh, take the position as director of the CIA. Ron was selected as the Republican nominee and then in April won the special election and sworn into office I think on April 25th, so right. seven months ago That's about, right. so Almost. a little bit there. So uh, <coughs> welcome to Wichita Liberty TV Representative Estes and the Mrs. Representative Estes, Susan, along with us as well. And when you were on this show in August, you said that you intended to run again next year for re-election. Anything changed in that regard? No, nope, still planning to that okay. I, I'm enjoying it. It's uh, it's uh, it's been a great experience to uh, to be up there and represent South Central Kansas. Uh, some days are more frustrating than others, but I, I'm still wanting to to do a good job to to represent our folks. I can imagine. So, um, since you were here, I get well. I guess one of the biggest news items lately is the tax bills that are working their way through Congress. The House has passed a bill. The Senate has a yet to pass a bill. Um, what are some of the highlights of that that uh, that our viewers need to know about? Yeah. I think the biggest thing that we wanted to do with that tax bill that we passed the House, and, and actually part of the overall framework that the House and the Senate have been working together on, is is how do we lower rates and and make that so that it's permanent as much as possible and and for extended period of time for both individuals and businesses. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to get rid of some of those uh, deductions, some of the special uh, loopholes that have been built in over time because the rates were so high. Mm -hmm. So the biggest push was getting, how do we get all the individual rates down? You know, we, we've gone from what was seven brackets down to uh, four. Mm -hmm. And so if you're you know, currently in a 10% bracket, you're going down to 0%. If a 15% bracket going down to 12 and and uh, same thing on, on 25 and, and 35 percent brackets as well. And I think at the same time, the, um, both of the bills nearly double the standard deduction. It'll be, I think, up to $12,000 for individuals or $24,000 right. for families. I think a lot of people may not know how that worked, but what's the kind of the arithmetic behind that if you're figuring out taxes? So, so the real driver there is, as of today in the current tax code, only 30% of the people itemize mm -hmm. at the federal level. So that means that 70% of people are already using the standard deduction uh, to, to do their taxes. And so our thinking was, if we can raise that standard deduction, then you need fewer deductions mm -hmm. because more and more people are going to, to be able to use the standard deduction. Uh, so if you can take $24,000 off uh, of your income as a family member, you know, that means the first $24,000 of everybody's, every, every family's salary is tax-free. Mm -hmm. and, and then it starts at 12% rate after that. So uh, it gives you a good cushion to start with. And as we've gone through that, what the, the Joint Tax Committee has done and some of the analysis has done is say that at every income level, there would be the overwhelming majority of people would get tax cuts. Mm -hmm. And just because of being able to, to uh, use that standard deduction and, and one of the estimates is that uh, only about 10% of the taxpayers will be left doing the itemized deduction in the future. I think that's kind of interesting because uh, I did a calculation this morning. One of the deductions that most, or at least a lot of people are able to take is the deduction for home in, uh, mortgage right. interest on their home mortgage. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, suppose you borrowed $200,000 on a mortgage and that'll buy a nice house, a very nice house in Wichita. Interest rates are about 4.09%, so that would mean you would pay $8,200, more or less, in interest in the first right. year. Even at the standard deduction right now of $12,000, I mean, 
you, you don't get to take advantage of that. And even if you paid thirteen thousand dollars in interest, you already get to deduct twelve thousand. So really, the margin only one thousand. And when we go to twenty-four thousand dollar in deduction, those calculations will even be more biased in not really making much use of those deductions. That, that's right. It'll ultimately be simpler, as well as people will have a better uh, better outcome on their taxes mm -hmm. than uh, by, by having that larger standard deduction. You know, but it does have that fallback option for those individuals that maybe have bought a large house, have a large mortgage payment, that also have charitable contributions and, and real estate taxes. They can mm -hmm. still itemize if they, if, if that amount puts them over the 24000 uh, I'm not sure there will be many people in the 4th District to do that, but some of the high-tax states, mm -hmm. those were the ones where uh, some of our members were really concerned about. Well, that was what I think there were like about a dozen Republicans, I think, that voted against this because it eliminates the SALT. Um, state and local tax deductions. Right. So high tax states, I think that California, New Jersey, and New York are most prominently mentioned. Right. You have a lot of local property tax or income tax and you can deduct that, but um, what's the status of, of yeah. that deduction? Yeah. Gone so, or? <clears throat> so in, in many of those states you have not just a state income tax, but you also have a city income yes. tax. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that income tax is not deductible in the, in the House version of the bill at all. But what we did include was uh, you can deduct property tax up to $10,000. Mm -hmm. And so there is some provision there for uh, owners of high-valued property that have a large property tax bill to still be able to use that if they itemize and don't take advantage of the, the $24,000 yeah. standard deduction. And $10,000 in property tax. There's probably not a lot of people in Wichita that have a there's, house that's valuable. Prob but probably not in our district. Yeah, uh, a few. Know, talking to a couple members, uh, particularly from California, that's a, a pretty common right. cost for some of the, the yeah, neighborhoods in their home, district. Average home is worth seven hundred or eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars So that's certainly that. Well, let's take a moment off for a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll continue talking about the tax bill with Representative Ron Estes. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks and our guest this week, Representative Ron Estes and Susan Estes with him there. So I was looking at a chart of the differences between the House bill and the Senate bill and it right. seems that one big thing that you'll have to hammer out somehow is that the Senate bill includes repealing the individual mandate, which I've heard is kind of what makes Obamacare work as well as it does or doesn't, you know. Yeah, the the Senate version. I'm not sure exactly what they're going to vote on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they keep they bringing haven't up, voted yet. That's so. right. They haven't voted yet. Uh, hopefully, they'll do that in the next week and a half or so, which would allow us to get into the conference committee because I'm, I'm sure their version will be slightly different than what we passed in the house. There's a lot of pressure to get this done by Christmas there, or the end of the there year. There really is, and, and it's just it just makes sense. I mean, we we've talked about tax reform for five or six years now, mm -hmm. and and really heavily put a push into it now that we have Republican majorities in the house and in the Senate and, and a Republican in the White House. Right. And, you know, th this isn't as much a Republican or Democrat issue as, say, health care was because mm -hmm. a lot of the things that are in this tax plan President Obama had proposed doing, uh, helping corporations, helping uh, uh, lower some of their rates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we sit and look at the version the House produced versus what might come out of the Senate, there's two or three things that have been uh, brought up as potential differences. One of them is talking about the individual mandate for, from Obamacare. And... Um, you know, that's roughly, I think, $238 billion mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in savings uh, that uh, the government can have by not paying the, a portion the subsidies. of the, the subsidies okay. for, for those uh, life insurance uh, or uh, health insurance programs. I have some mixed feelings about that. I mean, I'm a big advocate. We need to repeal and replace Obamacare. Um, the, the struggle I'm having with right now is we are so close without bringing in another $238 billion, because if we do, I'm afraid we'll squander it. I mean, we'll, we'll go look at, well, let's add this deduction back. Let's, let's add this unique uh, code item back in because 
we've got 230 million, 238 million dollars to play with. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather, let's see, can we use that for deficit reduction? Mm -hmm. Or can we use it maybe for some of the, the technical corrections that might come up next year and uh, run into that? So I'm, I'm not necessarily on board yet that we wanna jump right now. Uh, since we've gotten so far as we are and we've got a good bill. Uh, so that'll be one of those items that we talk about. Uh, there's a couple other things in the Senate bill that are different. Uh, one of them is that they, they delay a year to make the corporate cuts, right. uh, tax cuts uh, implemented. And I think that's a bad idea as well, just from the standpoint of there's been such a long period of time where Individuals and businesses have been expecting this. They've been gearing up. I mean, we're, we're starting to see the economy grow now, mm -hmm. partly because President Trump's in office, mm -hmm. but partly because people are expecting tax reform. Mm -hmm. And so if we delay giving them tax benefit, then it's gonna impact businesses in terms of whether they'll start up a new plant or whether they'll hire more workers. And, and so I'd rather see some of that benefit started sooner rather than later. And that is, I think, one of the, the goals of tax reform, at least from a conservative standpoint, is not, you know, we want people to be able to pay less, but we also want to set up an environment where businesses can grow and uh, get back to the 3% type of growth that we uh, we know our economy can do under the right condition, but it's been a long time since we've had that level it, of growth. It really has. I mean, for the last 10 years, uh, we were in the 2 to 2 and a quarter percent on average growth, mm -hmm. uh, whereas traditionally since World War II, we've, had, we've been over 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the last two quarters with President Trump in office, we've had over 3% economic mm -hmm. growth. And there's such a value in having more growth because we end up with more jobs. We'll have higher pay for the jobs we do have. And at the end of the day, we'll end up with more tax receipts because there is more growth in the economy. And so it, it'll just help all of us to have that economic growth. You know, a lot of people look and they say, well, 3% growth, 2% growth, that's only a 1% difference there. But no, it's really a 50% difference in the growth rate. And I think uh, it was, I think, uh, Albert Einstein who talked about the one of the most powerful forces in the universe being the miracle of compound interest. Mm -hmm. And these rates compounding over time, over you know, a lifetime, do make a huge yeah, difference. That's right. Well, and if you think about, you know, our, our typical GDP is fifteen trillion dollars mm -hmm. and one percent you know, that difference between 2% and 3%, but add 1% to that, another $150 billion in economic activity in the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of wages you can pay with that and a lot of, a lot of even tax revenue that comes in. Out and of I think when people think about how are we ever going to pay back the national debt, I mean, that's, first of all, we need to stop accumulating it. That's a that's big step right, right there. But the way to pay it back is to grow the economy while restraining spending, I right. think. And then, I you know Dan Mitchell of Cato has a lot of uh, research that if we can just slow down the rate of growth of spending yeah. a little bit, let the economy grow, eventually we'll pay back that it, debt. But, it, uh, exactly. That's a, that's a great idea that in terms of slowing down the rate of spending because mm -hmm. we, just, we just continue to increase our spending so much faster than we bring in. And if we can just slow that down, Unfortunately, some of the political pundits then start wailing and gnashing teeth that, you know, uh, instead of growing at 6%, you grow at 2%, and they call that a cut, you yeah. know, as opposed to still growing. Well, there's some issues with that in Kansas, and you recently had an article in the Wall Street Journal. We're going to talk about that a little bit right after this break. Welcome back again to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. Uh, we have Representative Ron Estes and Susan Estes with here is here in the studio today. So, Representative Estes, one of the uh, uh, things we hear in all sorts of media re regarding the tax reform at the national level is that this is just what Kansas did about six years ago, I think, and Kansas ended up in a mess. And you had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last week titled The Democrats' Kansas Distraction that talked about some of these issues. That, that's right. I mean, you're really comparing apples to oranges when you look at what the tax cuts that were done in Kansas uh, versus what we're looking at at the federal level. Uh, first and foremost, uh, one of the big points in Kansas was 
taking taking the pass-throughs, the LLCs, the LLCs, the partnerships, and making that all zero mm -hmm. instead of having uh, equal reductions for C corporations and 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 Chapter S corporations. So these are different forms of business organization right. that you can set up in Kansas, and most states I think have similar right. type of laws where instead of corporate taxes in Kansas, a corporation figures out profit and loss, then they distribute income as dividends or something like that. But in these pass-through entities, the income is not taxed at the business level, but it goes to your personal tax personal. and is taxed there. That's and right. Is That's that right. a problem or a good thing? Well, it, it's, it's a good thing going through to the to personal level. One of the things we're doing at the federal level is recognizing that if you own a small business, um, part of your return on capital should be the labor you put in, mm -hmm. but the rest of it should be because you're an owner. Mm -hmm. And so we want to distinguish that. And so uh, we, we've identified a 70-30 split in the federal tax code changes that we're looking at so that 70% uh, of it would be taxed at the business level, 30% at the individual level, uh, which would help both small businesses and large businesses that are set up as subchapter S's so mm -hmm. that uh, you, can, you can still have some personal income that comes through as wages, but then also recognizes some of that comes through as, as uh, business mm -hmm. uh, return on capital. And what else was the, or uh, some of the criticisms? What, one of the other things that was really different in, in Kansas is that even though rates were lowered, uh, that spending wasn't. Mm -hmm. Spending continued to increase. And the theory when that was put in place was that there'd be economic growth at the tail end that would, that would help uh, recover from that. Uh, but instead, uh, the spending continued, mm -hmm. and then we saw a decline in uh, oil and gas and in mm -hmm. agriculture, uh, and so uh, we didn't get the economic growth because of that. It was all blamed on the taxes, but really it was, it was an economic slowdown. Well, and the but, manufacturing, too, and I think, uh, you know, last year, we're, we're still struggling down here in Wichita. Last year, 2016, our GDP here actually shrank from the year yeah. before, and that's really... Yeah. Some bad news, I right. think. Which which really got all rolled into and described as it was a problem with the taxes, mm -hmm. and and that really wasn't the case at all. Um, so those those were the, probably the two biggest highlights. I mean, there were several other things that that contributed to that. Uh, for example, uh, just before the tax cuts were implemented, uh, the the federal stimulus money had been mm -hmm. used by uh, the predes Governor Brownback's predecessors in terms of building budgets. Uh, for a couple of years, and so they actually lowered state spending and backfilled it with, with federal, federal stimulus money. And then all of a sudden, when that was gone. when that disappeared, then you had to skyrocket the amount of spending that you had to that came out of the state budget to pay for that to fill in that gap. So and it I really just put more pressure. Also, we have to remember that these uh, tax cuts were kind of born. I don't want to say illegitimately, but there was a bit of a. It was almost like the Senate passed a bill to to um, start as a negotiating a negotiating stance with the House, but the House signed it and sent it to the governor. Yeah. He signed it. It was kind of a really a misstep, wasn't it, yeah. that the bill ever passed in that form? Yeah, you re you really go back to what what Governor Brownback had originally proposed was to reduce the, de the deductions mm -hmm. as well as lowering the rates. Uh, the version that came out of the Senate lowered the rates, but they didn't want it, they didn't eliminate the deductions. Mm -hmm. That was the only version that uh, made it to both chambers mm -hmm. uh, that they voted on. So the House passed it. Uh, I remember Governor Brownback uh, said, you know, I'd rather have something slightly different, but if I don't get anything different, I'll, I'll sign this bill. So that's the one he ultimately signed. Uh, to his credit, he took ownership of it, even though it wasn't the one that, that he originally proposed. And, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, we had some negative consequences out of that. So actually, we, we've taken some lessons learned from that at, at the federal level in terms of we want to make sure we eliminate uh, some of those deductions that, one, aren't going to be as valuable if your rates are down to 12% or 25%. Uh, you, you don't have as much value out of right. a deduction than if it, your your tax rates are 35% or 39.6%. Or, or and I uh, think people talk about in the 1950s, the top marginal income tax rate was 90 or 91%. And people said the economy was growing then, but no one really paid tax at those rates. People structured their affairs in all sorts of contortious ways to try to avoid paying that tax. That's right. That's We've seen this over and over again throughout recent history in the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, President Kennedy mm -hmm. uh, did the first major tax reform of those, those high rates. Uh, President Reagan did the same thing. A after both of those times, we saw economic growth in our country. 
uh, that, you know, thinking back after President Reagan's, it led to the boom in the 1990s with mm -hmm. uh, uh, such big economic growth. Actually, the great we got moderation, they call it, for about 25 that, years of growth. That's right. And we actually had a, a, a surplus in the federal budget for mm -hmm. a couple of years there yeah. uh, because of that. Under President Clinton, uh, no, no less than so. He got to take advantage of that, the Reagan yeah. tax cuts. <laughs> well, there was a lot of things going on there, too. I think they lowered capital gains tax rates, and that led a lot of people to sell shares of stocks and pay that tax, and That's big right. input to the Treasury there. So we're going to take our last commercial break for Wichita Liberty TV, and when we come back, we're going to find out what Mrs. Smith does when Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Welcome back to this final segment of Wichita Liberty TV for this week. I'm Bob Weeks, our guest Congressman Ron Estes and Mrs. Susan Estes. Uh, I invited you here today because you're scheduled to speak at the Wichita Pachyderm before long on a topic that you dreamed up titled, What Does Mrs. Smith Do While Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? So give us a little preview of that if you would please. Well, uh, John Todd and I were talking one day and he was hearing different stories about things that we do when we're in Washington and usually Ron is there and I'm here at home. Mm -hmm. You know, Ron and I still live here. Ron comes home every weekend. Our kids are still in school here and uh, Ron found, uh, John found it interesting. So an idea was born and they'll, people will get a chance to hear about uh, what I've learned about the White House. Mm -hmm. I've done a, quite a few White House tours and Capitol tours. I joke with people, I enjoy share, sharing their national history with, with them as well as uniting them with their tax dollars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, because it's when you see uh, Washington, you see where the sausage is, is made. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned something about the honor flights. Uh, what are those and, and uh, what does that mean to you to be able to help out with those? You know, it's something that's really important to Ron and I because his dad was able to participate in an honor flight and it started out as a program where they took World War II veterans mm -hmm. to the new Wash to the new World War II monument mm -hmm. and it was incredible it was a great experience for them and um, as time has gone by the program has been able to be expand into Korean veterans and mm -hmm. now most World War II veterans and many Korean veterans have gone in the program also includes Vietnam era veterans we have the one of the best honor flight programs in the nation we do an overnight trip, which is unusual. I'm not aware of anybody else in the nation doing that. And we have many flights a year. They take hundreds. They've recently had um, their 51st flight. And that gives you an idea of the work that's going on. And if, if they're hitting you up for a donation, it's a great program that people should support. They do wonderful work. But, and that's one of the things that I've treasured. If I happen to be in DC when a flight comes in or here at the airport when the flights come back, um, getting to see the veterans and thank them for what they've done and uh, particularly the Vietnam era veterans are so grateful because uh, we didn't give them the right welcome home the first time mm -hmm. and it's neat to make that right again. Mm -hmm. So we and we do have memorials now for all of those wars the World War II Korean War and Vietnam, although I think they were built in reverse order of the wars if I can uh, remember that correctly. So. Um, is there an official role or title for the spouses of Congress? There, there's not, and I keep getting asked that a lot. What should I call you? And it's been kind of amusing for me in a way that um, people say, "What should I call you?" I say, "Susan," but and a lot of people are like, "Great," and that's that's what they say. You know, that's what you used to call me before. And um, some people it makes them very uncomfortable, and they they want to say Mrs. Estes. So I really answer to whatever makes someone else comfortable. Mm -hmm. And. And besides the honor flights, what else do you do to help support the work of Representative Estes? Sometimes I attend events here, uh, spoke recently at one, um, and as much as I can be a set of ears for what's going on. And I've enjoyed very much being invited to a lot of the different organizations in town that have work going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's taking a look at what they do uh, on a firsthand experience, and it really helps me a lot. And, and I do this as well on occasion with 
Ron with businesses that he tours. Uh, when people are asking about, should I come to Kansas? What's it like in Kansas? I can be a really great cheerleader. Uh, you know, wasn't one in high school, so I can do it well now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is quite a, a sacrifice on families. I mean, Mike Pompeo talked about the first flight Monday morning. Is that mm -hmm. what you're on? And I know that's at about mm -hmm. 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. And then coming back late Thursday or Friday. So uh, it's a lot of work uh, and a sacrifice on the families uh, to do that. So um, in the last minute we have here, I wanted to ask very quickly, because I know people are talking about the chemical tests that may happen south of us in Oklahoma. What's up with that? Yeah, the Department of Homeland Security did, did a very poor job communicating with us what they're trying to, to accomplish. And so we're working to try to figure out what, what the, the truth is and what, what the details are. Uh, it seems like they're wanting to do some, some training exercise down there, uh, but they, they, they basically release to the community that they're, they're going to release some chemicals and they want to make sure the, the wind's blowing in the right direction, and which has really concerned uh, a lot of us in, in uh, South Central Kansas uh, of what kind of impact that might have. And mm -hmm. so uh, we, we've put, uh, reached out from our office to try to get some answers from Homeland Security about what they're trying to accomplish and, and why and how so that uh, we can make sure that the residents of South Central Kansas are protected. Mm -hmm. Is there some sort of test relating to how biological warfare might get passed about or well, something? It, or? Yeah, on, on the surface, you think it might be, mm -hmm. but they, they again, they did such a poor job communicating it that we, we want to make sure that that's, that's really what they're trying to do. There's, there's an old Indian school that's uh, across the state line in, in Oklahoma. And apparently they have leased that to uh, to utilize for for this testing activities mm -hmm. and and uh, part of the information we've gotten so far is that uh, they can th their intention is to try to figure out how uh, gases seep into buildings and and that if there were a an accidental release or an intentional release, a terrorist yeah. attack. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I think those are not scheduled to happen for a while, so we've got some time to figure out. That, uh, that's right, and that's that's really our big push, is let, let's figure out before we make some decisions and do things, is uh, wh what is trying to accomplish and make sure that things are safe for people in South okay. Central Kansas. Well, let's hope we can get that straightened out, and we'll, we'll trust that you uh, take care of that. So we're out of time today, so Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Estes, and uh, Thanks for filling us in on what you do while he's gone away. And thanks very much, Representative Estes, for your time today. And thank you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be back with another episode next week.